know what time it is? Woo! Get into it. Get into it! We're back with the story time with Chris. We're about to start chapter 19 of the Never Ending Story. Hope everybody's having a good day. Happy Monday. I know everybody dreads Mondays, but I look forward to it. Um, when you put negativity on things, it tends to ruin your day. I know that as somebody who deals with severe depression and anxiety on a consistent basis. It's always good to start the day positively. And no, I don't own the music that you're listening to in the background, which is brought to you again by Mr. Ambiance on YouTube. Please check them out. favorite tea it's been a good night and um status report for those who've been asking i'm good i'm doing much better than i was a few weeks ago so thank you for those who have been consistently checking on me and making sure i'm okay i appreciate you you know it, it makes life a lot easier knowing that you have good people in your corner that will bring you light and positivity and support you. So thank you. Thank you very much. Now, without further ado, because I got my glasses clean before I started, you know me, we will begin. Chapter 19, The Traveling Companions. Voila. I love these illustrations. They're amazing. That's one gift I wish I had to be able to draw my characters to life. I can only write about them. Sunbeams were fighting their way through the cloud cover as the travelers started out that morning. At last, the rain and wind had let up. In the course of the morning, the travelers ran in two or three sudden showers, but there was a marked improvement in the weather, and it seemed to grow warmer by the minute. The three knights were in a merry mood. They laughed and joked and played all sorts of tricks on one another, but Bastian seemed quiet and out of sorts as he rode ahead on his mule, and the knights had far too much respect for him to break in on his thoughts. The rocky high plateau over which they were riding seemed endless, but little by little the trees became larger and more frequent. Atreyu had noticed Bastion's bad humor. When he and Falcor started on their usual reconnaissance flight, he asked the luck dragon what he could do to cheer his friend up. Falcor only rolled his ruby red eyeballs and answered, That's easy. Did he want to ride on me? When some time later the little man routed a jutting cliff, they found Atreyu and the luck dragon lying comfortably in the sun. Bastion looked at them in amazement. Are you tired? he asked. Not at all, said Atreyu. I just wanted to ask if you let me ride Yika for a while. I've never ridden a mule. It must be wonderful because you've never seemed to get sick of it. I'll lend you my old Falcor in return. Bastion flushed with pleasure. Is that true, Falcor? he asked. You wouldn't mind carrying me? Of course not, all powerful Sultan, said the dragon with a wink. Hop on and hold tight. Without touching the ground, Bastion voted directly from mule to dragon back and clutched the silvery white mane as Falcor took off. Bastion hadn't forgotten how Gregorman had carried him through the Desert of Colors, but riding a white luck dragon was something else again. If sweeping over the ground on the back of the fiery lion had been like a cry of ecstasy, this gentle rising and falling as the dragon adjusted his movements to the air currents was like a song, now soft and sweet, now triumphant with power. Especially when Falcor was looping the loop, when his mane, his fangs, and the long fringes on his limbs flashed through the air like white flames. Ooh, excuse me. It seemed to Bastion that the winds were singing in chorus. Toward noon, they sighted the others and landed. The ground party had pitched camp beside a brook in the sunlit meadow. There was flat bread to eat, and a kettle of soup was cooking over a wood fire. The horses and the mule were grazing nearby. When the meal was over, the three knights decided to go hunting for supplies, especially if meat were running low. It heard the cry of pheasants in the thicket, and there seemed to be hares as well. Knowing the green skins to be great hunters, they asked a trader to join them. But he declined. Thereupon, the knights took their long bows, buckled on their quivers full of arrows, and went off to the woods. Atreyu, Falcor, and Bastion stayed behind. After a short silence, Atreyu suggested, How about telling us a little more about your world, Bastion? Why would it interest you? Bastion asked. Atreyu looked to the luck dragon. What do you say, Falcor? 
I'd like to hear something about the children of your school, said the dragon. Bastion seemed bewildered. What children? he asked. The ones who made fun of you, said Falcor. Children who made fun of me? Bastion repeated. I don't know of any children, and I'm sure no child would have dared to make fun of me. I tray you broke in, but you must remember that you went to school. Yes, said Bastion thoughtfully. I remember school. Yes, that's right. Atreyu and Falcor exchanged glances. I was afraid of that, Atreyu muttered. Afraid of what? You've lost some of your memory, said Atreyu gravely. This time it came of changing the Akaris into Shlamuf's. You shouldn't have done that. Bastion Balthazar books, said the Lug Dragon, and his tone almost stern. If my advice means anything to you, stop using the power that Orin gives you. If you don't, you're likely to lose your last memories. And without memory, how will you ever find your way back to where you came from? To tell the truth, said Bastion, I don't want to go back anymore. Atreyu was horrified. But you have to go back. You have to go back and straighten out your world so humans will start coming to Fantastica again. Otherwise, Fantastica will disappear sooner or later and all our trouble will have been wasted. At that point, Bastion felt rather offended. But I'm still here, he protested. It's been only a little while since I gave Moonchild her new name. Atreyu couldn't think of nothing to say, but then Valcor spoke up. Now, he said, I see why we haven't made the slightest progress in fighting Bastion's way back, if he himself doesn't want to. Bastion, said Atreyu almost pleadingly, isn't there anything that draws you? Something you love? Don't you ever think of your father who must be waiting for you and worrying about you? Bastion shook his head. I don't think so. Maybe he's even glad to be rid of me. Atreyu looked at his friend in horror. The way you two carry on, said Bastion bitterly, you almost sound as if you wanted to get rid of me too. What do you mean by that? asked Atreyu with a catch in his voice. Well, said Bastion, you seem to only have one thing on your minds, getting me out of Fantasca as quickly as possible. Atreyu looked at Bastion and slowly shook his head. For a long while, none of them said a word. Already Bastion was beginning to regret his angry words. He himself knew they were unjust. Then, Atreyu said softly, I thought we were friends. You were right, Atreyu, Bastion cried. We were, and always will be. Forgive me, I've been talking nonsense. Atreyu smiled. You'll have to forgive us, too, for hurting your feelings. We didn't mean it. Anyway, said Bastion, I'm going to take your advice. After a while, the three knights returned with several uh, partridges, a pheasant, and a hare. When the party started out again, Bastion was riding Yika. In the afternoon, they came to a forest consisting entirely of tall, straight evergreens, which formed high overhead, a green roof so dense that a ray of sunlight seldom reached the ground. It may have been why they were, there was no underbrush. The soft, smooth forest floor was pleasant to ride on. Falkor was riding himself to trotting along with the company, because if he had flown above the treetops with Atreyu, he would have undoubtedly have lost sight of the others. All afternoon they rode through the dark green twilight. Toward nightfall they spied a ruined castle on a hilltop. They climbed up to it and in the midst of all the crumbling walls and turrets, halls and passages they found a vaulted chamber that was in fairly good condition. There they settled down for the night. It was red-headed Hisbald's turn to cook and he proved to be much better at it than his predecessor. The pheasant he roasted over the fire was as tasty as you pleased. The next morning they resumed their journey. All day they rode through the forest which looked the same on all sides. It was in the late of the day when they noticed that they must have been riding in a great circle, for ahead of them they saw the ruins of the castle they had left in the morning, but this time they were approaching it from a different direction. This has never happened to me before, said Hykerion, twirling his black mustache. I can't believe my eyes, grumbled his ball, stalking through the ruins on his long, thin legs. But so it was. The remains of yesterday's dinner left no room for doubt. Atreyu and Falcor said nothing, but their thoughts were hard at work. How could they have made such a mistake? In the evening meal, this time it was roast hare, prepared more or less competently by Hykerion. The three knights asked Bastion if he would care to impart some of his memories of the world he came from. Bastion excused himself by saying he had a sore throat, and since he had been very quiet all that day, the knights believed him. Oh, excuse me. After suggesting a few effective remedies, they lay down to sleep. Only Atreyu and Falcor suspected what Bastion was thinking. Early in the morning, they started off again. All day, they rode through the forest, trying their best to keep going in a straight line. But at night, they were back at the same ruined castle. Well, I'll be. I'm going mad. 
Hyperion blustered, groaned, his bald. Friends, said Hydor disgustedly, we might as well throw our licenses in the trash bin. Some nights errant we turned out to be. On their first night at the castle, Bastion, knowing that Yika liked to be alone with her thoughts now and then, had found her a little, special little niche. The company of the horses, who could think of nothing to talk about but their distinguished ancestry, upset her. That night, after Bastion had taken her back to her place, she said to him, Master, I know why we are not getting ahead. How can you know that, Yika? Because I carry you, Master, and because I'm only half a donkey, I feel certain things. So according to you, what is it? You don't want it to go ahead, Master. You've stopped wishing for that. Bastion looked at her in amazement. You really are a wise animal, Yika. The mule flapped her long ears in embarrassment. Do you know which way we've been going? No, said Bastion. Do you? Yika nodded. We've been heading for the center of Fantastica. For the Ivory Tower? Yes, Master. And we made good headway as long as we kept going in that direction. That's not possible, said Bastion. A tree would not have noticed, and certainly Falcor would have, but they didn't. We mules, said Yika, are simple creatures, not in a class with luck dragons, but we do have certain gifts, and one of them is a sense of direction. We never go wrong. That's how I knew for sure that you wanted to visit the childlike empress. Moonchild, Bastion murmured. Yes, I would like to see her again. She'll tell me what to do. And he stroked the mule's white nose and whispered, Thanks, Yika. Thanks. Next morning, Atreyu took Bastion aside. Listen, Bastion, Falcor and I want to apologize. The advice we gave you was meant well, but it was stupid. We just haven't been getting ahead. Falcor and I talked it over last night. You'll be stuck here, and so will we, until you wish for something. It's bound to make you lose some more of your memory, but that can't be helped. There's nothing else you can do. We can only hope that you can find a way back before it's too late. It won't do you any good to stay here. You just have to think of your next wish and use Orin's power. Right, said Bastion. Yuka said the same thing. But I already know what my next wish will be. Let's go. I want you all to hear it. They rejoined the others. Friends, said Bastion in a loud voice. So far we've been looking in vain for the way back to my world. Now I've decided to go and see the one person who can help me find it. That one person is the childlike empress. Our destination is now the ivory tower. Hurrah, cried the three knights in unison. But then Valcor's bronze voice rang out. Don't do it, Bastion Balthazar Bucks. When what you wish is impossible. Don't you know that no one can meet the golden-eyed commander of wishes more than once? You will never see her again. Bastion clenched his fist. Moonchild owes me a lot, he said angrily. I'm sure she won't keep me away. You'll see, Falcor replied, that her decisions are sometimes hard to understand. Bastion felt the color rising to his cheeks. You and Atreyu, he said, are always giving me advice. You can see where your advice has got us. From now on, I'll do the deciding. I've made up my mind, and that's that. He took a deep breath, went on a little more calmly. Besides, you always speak from your point of view. You two are fantastic kids, and I'm a human. How can you be sure that the same rules apply to me as to you? It was different when Atreyu had Orin. And who else but me is going to give the gem back to Moonchild? No one can meet her twice, you say, but I've already met her twice. First time we saw each other for only a moment. But Atreyu went into her chamber, and the second time when the big egg exploded, with me, everything is different. I will see her a third time. All were silent. The knights, because they didn't know what it was all about, Atreyu and Falcor, because they were beginning to have doubts. Well, said Atreyu finally, maybe you're right. We have no way of knowing how the childlike empress will deal with you. After that, they started out, and before noon, they reached the edge of the forest. Before them laying slopping meadows as far as the eye could see. Again, soon they came to a winding river and followed its course. Again, Atreyu and Falcor explored the country, describing wide circles around their slow-moving companions, but both were troubled and their flight was not as light and carefree as usual. Looking ahead, they saw that the country changed abruptly as a certain point in the distance. A steep slope led from the plateau to a low-lying, densely wooded plain, and the river descended the slope in a mighty waterfall. Knowing that the riders couldn't hope to get that far before the next day, the two scouts turned back. Falcor, Atreyu asked, do you suppose the childlike empress cares what becomes of Bastion? Maybe not, said Falcor. She draws no distinctions. Then, said Atreyu, she is really a... Don't say it, 
Falcor broke in. I know what you mean, but don't say it. For a while, Atreyu was silent. Then he said, But he's my friend, Falcor! We've got to help him, even against the childlike Empress's will, if we have to. But... But how? With luck! <laughs> the dragon replied, and for the first time, the bronze bell of his voice seemed to have sprung a crack. That evening, the company chose a deserted log cabin on the riverbank as their night lodging. For Falcor, of course, it was too small, and he preferred to sleep on the air. The horses and Yuka also had to stay outside. During the evening, Neil Atreyu told the others about the waterfall and the abrupt change in the country. Then he added casually, By the way, we're being followed. The three knights exchanged glasses. Oh, cried Hykiria, giving his black mustache a martial twirl. How many are they? I count seven behind us, said Atreyu, but even if they ride all night, they can't be here by four morning. Are they armed? asked Tisbald. Couldn't tell, said Atreyu, but there are more coming from other directions. I saw six in the west, nine in the east, and twelve or thirteen are coming from up ahead. We'll wait and see what they want, said Hydor. Thirty-five or thirty-seven men would hardly frighten the three of us, much less Sir Bastion and Atreyu. Ordinarily, Bastion ungrit the sword Sikanda before lying down to sleep, but that night he kept it on and slept with his hand on the hilt. In his dreams, he saw Moonchild smiling at him, and her smile seemed full of promise, but there was any more to the dream. He forgot it by the time he woke up, but his vision encouraged him in his hope of seeing her again. Glancing out the door of the cabin, he saw seven blurred shapes through the mist that had risen from the river. Two were on foot, the others mounted on different sorts of steeds. Bastion quietly awakened his companions. The knights unsheathed their swords, and together they stepped out of the cabin. When the figures waiting outside caught sight of Bastion, the riders dismounted, and all seven went down on their left knees, bowed their heads, and cried out, Hail and welcome to Bastion Balthazar Bucks, the savior of Fantastica! The newcomers were a weird-looking lot. One of the two had come on foot, had an uncommonly long neck, and a head with four faces, one pointed each end of the four each of the four directions. The first was merry, the second angry, the third sad, and the fourth sleepy. All were rigid and unchanging, but it was he was able at any time to face forward with the one expressing his momentary mood. This individual was a four quarter troll, sometimes known as a moody woody. The second pedestrian was what is known in Fantastica as a head footer. His head was connected directly with his long thin legs, there being neither neck nor trunk. Headfooters are always on the go and have no fixed residence. As a rule, they roam about in swarms of many hundreds, but from time to time one runs across a loner. They feed on herbs and grasses. The one that was kneeling to Bastion looked young and red-cheeked. The three creatures riding on horses no larger than goats were a gnome, a shadow scamp, and a blondie cat. The gnome had a golden circlet around his head and was obviously a prince. The shadow scamp was hard to recognize because to all intents and purposes he consisted only of a shadow cast by no one. The blondie cat had a cat-like face and long golden blonde curls that clothed her like a coat. Her whole body was covered with equally blonde shaggy fur. She was no bigger than a five-year-old child. Another who was riding on an ox came from the land of the Sassafranians, who are born old and died when they are grown to infancy. This one had a long white beard, a bald head, and a heavily wrinkled face. By Sassafranian standards, he was a youngster about Bastion's age. A blue gin had come on a camel. He was tall and thin and was wearing an enormous turban. His shape was human, but his broad, bare torso with its bulging muscles seemed to be made of some glossy blue metal. Instead of a nose and mouth, he had a huge hooked eagle's beak. Who are you? What do you mean? Hykirian asked rather brusquely. Despite the ceremonious greeting, he wasn't quite convinced of the visitor's friendly intentions. He still had his hand on his sword hilt. The four-quarter troll, who up until then had been keeping his sleepy face foremost, now switched to the merry one. Ignoring Hykirian, he addressed himself to Bastion. Your lordship, he declared, we are princes from many different parts of Fantastica, and we have all come to welcome you and ask for your help. The news of your presence has flown from country to country. The wind and the clouds speak your name. The waves of the sea proclaim your glory, and every last brooklet is celebrating your power. Bastion cast a glance at Atreyu, but Atreyu looked at the troll unsmilingly and almost severely. We know, the blue djinn broke in, and his voice sounded like the rasping cry of an eagle. We know that you create peril in the night forest and go at the desert of colors. We know you have eaten and drunk the fire of the many-colored death. 
and bathed in it, something that no one else in Fantastica could have done and still lived. We know that you have passed through the Temple of a Thousand Doors, and we know what happened in the Silver City of Amarganth. We know, my lord, that there is nothing you cannot do. We, when you make a wish, your wish comes to pass, and so we invite you to come and stay with us and favor us with a story of your own, for none of our nations has a story. Bastion thought it over, then shook his head. I can't do what you ask of me just yet. I'll help you later on, but first I must go to the Childlike Empress. I hope you will join us and help us to find the Ivory Tower. The creatures didn't seem at all disappointed. After brief deliberation, they agreed to accompany Bastion on his journey. Whereupon, the procession, which by now had the look of small caravans, started out again. Throughout the day, they enjoyed by new adherents, not only those Atreyu had sighted the day before, but many more. There were goat-legged fawns and gigantic night hobs. There were elves and kobolds and beetle riders and three leggies and mid-sized roosters in jackboots, a stag with golden antlers who walked erect and wore a Prince Albert. Many of the new arrivals bore no resemblance whatsoever to human beings. There were helmeted copper ants, strangely shaped wandering rocks, flute birds who made music with their long beaks, and there were three so-called puddlers who moved by dissolving into a puddle at every step and resuming their usual form a little farther on. But perhaps the most startling of all was a twee, whose fore and hide quarters had a way of running about independently of one another. And a, had a way of running about independently of one another, except for its red and white stripes, it looked rather like a hippopotamus. Soon the procession numbered at least a hundred, and all had come to welcome Bastion, the savior of Fantastica, and beg him for a story of their own. But the original seven told the others that they would first have to go to the ivory tower. All were agreed. Hykiri and Hisbald and Hydorn rode with Bastion in the lead of the now rather impressive procession. Toward evening they came to a waterfall, leaving the plateau. They made their way down a winding mountain trail, at the end of which they found themselves in a forest of tree-sized orchards with enormous spotted blossoms. These blossoms looked so frightening that when the travelers stopped for the night, they decided to post sentries. Bastion and Atreyu gathered some of the deep, soft moss that lay all about them and made themselves a comfortable bed. Falcor protected the two friends by lying in a circle around them. The air was warm and heavy with a strange and none-too-pleasant set of the orchards. That scent seemed fraught with evil. And that <clears throat> is a story for another day. Ah, this cover is amazing. It's so pretty. But, thank you all so much. See you next time. Thank you all so much, y'all.